Hi, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Peg and I are so glad you could spend a little part of your weekend with us here on Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. And, you know, it's a, a brand new season. Summer is officially here, right. even though I consider Memorial Day to be the start of summer. But uh, a whole new season for discovering new things in the garden. So we've got some great ideas for you today, especially if you have a shady area in your landscape. And I do. Mm -hmm. And have had. Right. <laughs> Through actually most unusual 54 years of gardening in the there same place, go. okay? Not many people can say that. <laughs> no, not. <laughs> um, it causes an accumulation of things, maybe, you know, but anyway, it's wonderful. Now, we are summertime, mm -hmm. so that's when you really, really appreciate the our shade. shade yes. <laughs> you know. It's much pleasanter to be out in it and to be working in it. Mm -hmm. And we have so many questions about what can I grow in the shade. Right. And and I've got it all right there. Mm. And that is what we're going to talk about. I've used my garden as an experimental place. It's a family place. It is informal. It suits our needs. And that's what every landscape should be is something that complements the way you use it. Mm -hmm. There are outdoor spaces. And as we go through today's program, I, I want to tell you what is in the backyard space only to let you know what you can use. And if you don't have shade, how you can create it in right. interesting shade and adapt it to smaller spaces because it can be done. You just have to be selective. But as we go through this program, the most important thing you can remember is put the right plant in the right place. If it's dry shade, you go with that. If it's moisture shade, you've got other choices. But there are many choices, and we will talk about them today. We will, and we have a lot to talk about, so we're not going to be taking phone calls today. Um, just. Just so much to talk about, so yes, many pictures to, to share with you, because uh, because Peg's garden is incredible. So you've got to, if you can't experience it in person, maybe you can experience it well, here. Well, pictures <laughs> worth a thousand words. Right, um, and I did want to mention bef before we get started, you know, it's a new season, you know, and things are changing in the garden center. It's just so neat to see all the different newer plants, you know, new right. to the season blooming, the daylilies and, uh -huh. and that type of thing. I did, I did want to mention those, uh, all of those things specifically mm -hmm. because it is important to see what these plants look like. For instance, in the perennial section, there's a huge collection of the most beautiful daylilies. And yesterday, I really wanted to go through and pick many of them but guess what they are day, day lilies, lilies. <laughs> which means they last only one day mm -hmm. and I couldn't come bringing all those big old pots down right here. exactly <laughs> <laughs> so the only way to really enjoy the choices that can be made in these day lilies is to come and see them mm -hmm. and and those change will change over the next few weeks because day lilies have a long period of bloom mm -hmm. okay here on the set in front of us are various varieties of hydrangea. The world of hydrangea has opened up so that it is just unreal. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're nostalgic. We go back to the old Nico Blue, and I still love it. But there's so many out there now, including those that will rebloom. So to see and appreciate these things, you need to come and look at them because they're in bloom. And um, hybrid lilies, mm -hmm. incredibly beautiful. I just cannot be without hybrid lilies. I was able to pick one long bloom here of just one variety. And I wanted to run into the garden early this morning and, and pick others because they're just coming into bloom and they're so spectacular. But come and see them walking through the perennial section, there's so many different varieties. You know, I should have mentioned when you were talking about the daylilies, <coughs> we've got some beautiful Stella Dioro uh, yeah. daylilies on special this week. So, we? yes, great. so come on yeah. in. That's mm -hmm. a nice little front of the border one, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. So you have a couple of tips for us before we get started. Yes. It's always good to have tips of the week. Well, there are some things that we need to be doing in the garden right now. 
And one of them is pruning, and it's getting a little late for some things. No, it's still timely. With pruning, you certainly don't like to do heavy pruning after the middle of July for sure. Your new growth needs to harden off completely before winter hits, or you're going to have an issue. Mm -hmm. With azaleas, for instance. One good way to um, make them denser and have more bloom is when the new growth, and this is all new growth, is out, is to snip that just above a leaf area. Okay, yeah, let me do that again. close up. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Now it's going to come out below there. <coughs> With azaleas, they have latent buds along here. You can even restrict the growth by going back into that, okay? Like so. New growth will come out along that stem. Fantastic. Well, you want to take a little sip there? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I've, had, I've had these issues before, we as any of you who watch. <laughs> I fill my car with all these blooms, and it doesn't bother me out in the garden. Right. But when I fill the car and it sits overnight, Boy, oh boy, it can play with my voice. And she's fine until 8.01. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Anyway, mm -hmm. I do want to tell you, and I've got these little miniatures. I have a lot of the miniatures in containers and in the ground. And to keep some of them really tiny, is this is the time to do it. This is a wonderful little Hinoki cypress. And let me be sure I'm on camera now. There we go. But you can come in and snip that little guy and restrict that growth. You can even, with this, shear a little bit of that, and this will, will restrict the growth size and, and force out new growth. So you can keep these small plants small. Let me bring up another one here. This is a juniper, and you can see that it has shot up some new growth here. I don't want that. I'm gonna go back in here and snip it out, okay? And you notice she's using her Joyce Chen scissors. I did. <laughs> and I said to Debbie, I picked up the dirtiest ones here <laughs> because I, I use them constantly. I have them in my kitchen. I have them in my, uh, obviously my bag that right. I work in the garden in. She's got a couple pairs in her car. Yeah, <laughs> Can't be without them, you know, even for opening cellophane mm -hmm. packages, for mm -hmm. goodness sakes. Snip. Nothing beats this with the small plants. If I have heavy stems, okay, boxwood. It's important to, tr to trim boxwood now. I do a lot of my trimming, as many of you who watch the show, um, judiciously pruning mm -hmm. in December. Right. So that I can use them as greens. And I have many boxwood because they thrive in a shady environment and there are in my hand are numerous varieties of boxwood and they're so beautiful and you will see some long pieces here that is the way to do it right now go in and take out a few long pieces because that opens up that plant to both air and light and it will be much healthier, okay? Great. You can come back in after you've done that and you can shear, okay? And these Joyce Chins are great for that too. To uh, restrain the growth, uh, make it more round, but another thing I couldn't be without is my Felco pruners mm -hmm. because that's what I use to make those heavier cuts. All right. So pruning is important. Great right now. tips. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Hi everybody, welcome back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. Peggy has gone out into her garden. Well, in a way. She's at our virtual garden today. So Peggy, you've got lots of things to show us today. Yes, thank you. And uh, many of you have heard me speak many times of the fact that I am not anti-chemical, but that I am judicious use of chemicals. In this very naturalistic environment, I have a lot of wildlife. 
most of which I enjoy, a few I'd love to be without, okay? And I bet you can guess that deer happen to be one of them. But here, joining me on this set is one that's a joy. And I found this little guy when I was out taking these pictures this last week. It was a baby box turtle. And I thought I would share that with you. Please be careful with those because there's not as many of them as there used to be. So this little turtle was sharing my space and let's go and look at that space. In the next picture, we've got an overview. Okay, let me step back so that you can see it. I actually last week, took this picture from an upstairs bedroom window. One of my daughters said, oh mom, that's the view I always was able to see from my window. And it is. It's looking down on a tremendous amount of diversity, but a lot of outdoor family living space. Now, what you don't see or could just barely detect is the home of a neighbor on the back side of our property. And so the property line comes into here. Most of us do appreciate having um, some sort of uh, a border definition and some privacy. And so that particular area is well covered with beautiful, beautiful plants. Now. Um, where it, at this time of the year, it definitely is uh, tones of green. Or if you saw those Japanese maple, it has the beautiful burgundies, which give you a lot of interest. And we're going to talk about the diversity that was in that overview as we move along. I get my color from containers. This is dappled light through the entire day with some direct streams of light. And so I can grow a large number of plants. These containers furnish great beauty. And I try different things in those containers. I go to the perennial section. I use the hookera or the tiarella. I go to the um, tropicals and have those to the greenhouse and put some of those things in and notice that I use the Carex in the containers as well as out in the garden. Let's move on with some of this because I get so enthusiastic about all of these various plants. I talk about it an awful lot. All right, here, here is an, a view where you can see the actual layout of the property. I want to, let's stay on this for a moment because I want to talk about the fact that I have a huge canopy of primarily oak trees. Then I have an understory of wonderful both evergreen and deciduous plants. Those that hold their leaves all winter, which is the holly and the hanoki cypress and the small magnolia. Those are a few of those things, okay? But I have dogwood and I have two or three varieties of dogwood because they bloom at different times. They give me interest at different times. If you only have a small space, you can choose dogwood or one of the alternative medium-sized trees to fill that need. Also a part of this is evergreen shrubs, like Lakothawe. It's filled with azaleas. There's rhododendron. That's the next level. But the, another wonderfully important part of that is the ground cover level. And now we're going to, we were looking down on that. Now we're looking into it. And there's some lawn here. And it does well because it gets good dappled light throughout the entire day. All of these oak trees are, are limbed up, okay? So, the lawn is useful to move you from one space to the other. There are a lot of small spaces in here. You can walk down this lawn and go in this direction and go behind this bed, or you can go over into this area and you've got two choices, to go up by the home or around on the other side to lead you into the front garden. But look at the ground covers here. There's Pachysandra, and the deer don't eat Pachysandra, by the way, and there's a wonderful area in through here. Ground covers anything that covers the ground. This is fern, 
and uh, a wonderful phlox that blooms in the spring, lots of different kinds of fern, and a row of beautiful boxwood. So there's a lot going on here. But let's show you this other picture, which is using that outdoor space, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, this pollen thing is running on. This is the neighbor's house back here, which you can hardly see because I have planned it that way. It's a diversity of plants. It's that understory of the dogwood and many of the different types of flowering things in here, but there's a beautiful waterfall in here too, which looks very natural because it looks like it's just disappearing into the woods. Look at the ground covers here. There's hosta, there, there's a blend, it's, it's a mass here of liriope, and in the next picture, outdoor living space. It's right there where you can sit and enjoy that waterfall, and enjoy the fish, and talk. Okay, I'm a mosquito magnet. Now I'm playing with some of this, which I'll tell you about later. But in the meantime, there is an electric area here that runs the waterfall, okay? I have discovered that if I bring a fan out here and it goes, we can sit and enjoy and no mosquitoes. So, we'll be back in a moment to discover more about this back garden. Yes, nostalgia. That was a picture of the blue hydrangea. We do a lot of things because of nostalgia. Our mother did it or our grandmother did it, you know. And we don't want to give up on some of those older plants. They're, they were there for a reason. It's fun to play with some of the new ones. Okay, I'm back in the garden and trying to help you think through what do I like? What do I want to put together? How can I make this garden really interesting? And I am in that area still. Over in here is the waterfall and a sitting area. Yes, you need to enjoy this garden. That's what it's all about. There's the ground cover pachycendra. This was taken when some of the azaleas were in bloom. I have a variety of azaleas that bloom at different times. This is a dogwood. Comes into bloom in the spring. It's the native dogwood, and so it's early. Further into the back in here now are the kusa dogwood, which are in bloom now. You could choose any of the smaller blooming plants. In the fall, you're going to get interest because those plants are going to change with the seasons. And so you have a garden that evolves and that's what you want to think about when you are planning or adding to your garden. There's evergreen mixed with those plants that lose their leaves. There's large native uh, holly, but there are a lot of holly to choose from and a lot of different sizes of holly that you can use. It's a wonderful evergreen and one that doesn't horrifically overgrow. You can use back in here some of the arborvitaes to help become a part of that privacy border. But it's not flat, okay? For me, it doesn't work to have a row of arborvitae, but it may work for other people. It may work in a more formal environment. This is very layered. You, as I said, you have the top, which is are the oak. You've got a numerous collection of the different next level down, and then you've got another level with the variety of shrubs. There is Lakothawe in here, and you can see the touch of ferns. You can see a touch of ferns over here. I have Japanese maples everywhere. Some are green, some are gold. Oh, the, the, wind, the fall color is fantastic. Let's roll through some of these other pictures because we're going to um, talk about specifically the ground covers right now. This is the Pachysandra, okay? This is Nandina rising out of it. I love the old Nandina, the Nandina domestica, because it blooms so beautiful. It's in bloom right now, and soon it will form its red berries, and I'll use those for Christmas decorations. A late blooming azalea. This is a mass of azalea that is at the edge of a large native holly. Let's continue with this. 
blends of these plants as we're coming out from this. This lawn is leading you, you can go this way or you can go this way. So there are pathways that lead you through the garden without your even thinking about it. There is a mixture of azaleas and Pieris japonica that border the deck area. And stepping down from that, a blend of hasta, a large hasta with a medium-sized hasta here. And at the edges, there's tiny little hasta, which makes for a lot of interest. You got a lot of change in textures. Okay, now from that same window that I took a picture, looking in the direction of the border and the neighbor's home, now I have aimed that camera in the other direction. And there is an, a patio out from the deck and you can see a portion of that here. Again, another sitting space that you can enjoy. Many, many Japanese maple. There's different varieties of those and the color that they give. You can see a cascading one back here. That is repetition of color and plants. Doesn't have to be the same plant, but it gives you the feeling of being the same plant. Here is a wonderful one. Over in here are a couple of others and you're looking down into that space. Again, this is a Japanese maple. It's growing in a container. It's amazing what you can do in containers. And guess what? There are more containers there with color in them. All right, let's go down to that space. What we were looking at was the, the patio that's right here. And this is a border planting because down in this area, there, there's a sunken patio that comes out from the basement area. And so this is masked again with different varieties of hasta that work well together. You can sit those if you're making a decision to gather and determine do they complement each other in their color or not. And then I mix the carex a change of texture in those plants, which is very, very interesting. And again, you see the containers there. Now, this again, late blooming azalea. This is how you can keep that color going. Granted, if your space is smaller, you've got some choices to make, okay? Here is a wonderful, wonderful Pieris japonica. And let's see if we, I think I have a picture that shows that closer up as we go along. Okay, the, I just wanted to get, to get the feeling of what this space really looks like. We are looking now back at the border that we saw earlier with all that blend of plants that gives me privacy. And, and we're looking back on the picture that we just saw. This is an area that's probably 15 feet wide with some variation, okay? And you're seeing all these different blends of plants. And back in this area is the deck. I think we have one more picture in this segment. Yes, okay, here we go. Another, I've stepped back just a little farther to get this picture and you can see boxwood. I have boxwood everywhere. But look what you can do in the shade. It's incredible and I love it. We'll be back in a moment to talk more about it. Hi everybody, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your little trip into Peggy's garden and we'll show some more of that in a little bit, but uh, it's beautiful, just beautiful. And we were talking about textures in that garden. Mm -hmm. Whether it's um, the texture of the fern, and I picked this, this is an autumn fern. Here again, there are so many fern that are available. What are some of the ways of achieving success in a shade garden? You have to adapt. You have to have the right plant in the right place. If your shade is coming from a silver maple, you are dealing with surface roots. Those roots are going to get all the water, they're gonna get all the nutrients, they're, they're just 
hungry for all right. that. And anything you plant under there is going to suffer unless you supplement that, okay? My suggestion if you have a silver maple is create a beautiful sitting area, deal with containers directly under it, and plant on the perimeters, okay? So you've got to know, do I have dry shade or do I have shade that is normal moisture or not difficult to water in well, if it's dry, okay? So the right plant in the right place. Now, let's talk about the hosta again. Beautiful choices in hostas. There are large ones. I love this one, okay? One of my favorite large hostas of June. That doesn't happen to be the one this is. They're medium size hosta, and they play well together. When I said choose those that complement each other, because they do play well. Here's one with a little bit more variegation, but guess what? It's all in the same tune. And then you can shoot, you can go in and see the little miniatures and plant those around it in spaces. It's beautiful. What else goes with that? What else was in those pictures that you did not see? And it blooms, but the foliage is beautiful. Is a plant called pulmonaria. Complements these, picks up the color tones. It's low growing. It's very hardy. It blooms in the spring. It stays beautiful for a long time. Hard to beat those particular ones, okay? I'm going to reach over here, Debbie, okay? Mm -hmm. Because there are bleeding hearts. Beautiful. The old-fashioned bleeding hearts are absolutely beautiful. I can't be without them. I have many of them. But this particular one will bloom for a long period of time. Um, Especially if you deadhead every now and then. It will really, really keep going. And if, if we could, and he's doing a wonderful job with this camera, but if we came in really close, you could see that that is one fantastically beautiful, beautiful little flower. It's called bleeding heart commonly, okay? And this is a new variety, so it's fun to try some of those new varieties. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the color at the edges of that. It's wonderful. And it blends with all these things. And near where I have that planted are the carrots. Again, a change of textures here that makes that just so incredible. Debbie, can you mm -hmm. hold on to those for a moment? Mm -hmm. And let me lift these into place. Look, look what's going on there. It makes for a garden that's very, very interesting to be in. Absolutely. There is something going on all the time. It does not have to be just plants that flower. But it's, it's just wonderfully interesting. Now, here again, I'm going to have to do a disappearing act. <laughs> and the choices are just endless. It, it, you know, if you come by the garden center and see the selection that we have at Maryfield, uh, you'll be amazed. I want to come back up with the, sorry that I had to reach over. It's <laughs> the way it is. Um, a plant that isn't used very much and is wonderful in the shade. I, I love the sweet box. The, the, that's the common name, and sarcocoa. It's kind of a mouthful, but okay, that's the Latin name. This plant, for me, grows about two to two and a half feet tall. It's evergreen. It has a very fragrant blossom in, in March. After that, it's just green all year. This is an incredible ground cover. Out in that under story, under the canopy of trees, or it is around and complementing smaller trees. If your space is small, okay, you can still have this. There's this wonderful magnolia. I love little gem. It goes in a big landscape or it goes in a small landscape. It's in bloom right now. And, and the leaves are so lush. Including oh, the back yeah. side of those leaves. I love the, yes, the textures on it that. Is, it has mm -hmm. that lovely uh, brownish, mm -hmm. uh, Almost looks there's one fuzzy. called bracken brown <laughs> that's beautiful. And then there's many different types of holly, even the variegated holly. This one is absolutely beautiful. And in that 
landscape that you just saw, but you didn't see a close-up, is a variegated Pierish Japonica. So these are some of the plants that really, really give us so much interest. I do have dwarf hemlock. I, I don't plant the big hemlock now because uh, the, it, it's, I do, I do love the textures of this and the fact that it does well in the shade. I like the little ones because if it gets that woolly adelgid on it, all that I have to do is hit it with a hard spray of water. Butter. And mm -hmm. this is one advantage to having to go out and water those containers. You're looking, you're seeing, if a problem arises or an insect that you don't want, hit it with a blast of water. And the next this, the thing for you to do after that, take a clipping of your plants, take them into the garden center to our plant clinic. Let those people diagnose exactly what it is and then use that chemical that applies to that particular thing. Don't just throw a chemical at your plant. Right. Know what that chemical is doing and I'm, I'm so thrilled with all of the people that work our plant clinics because they're so knowledgeable. They're so accustomed to seeing a problem that they can tell you, are you watering this correctly or not? Because that's so important. The watering part of it, getting it right. Not too much, not too little. But that's what they're there for. You know? uh, and it's the best way to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Using chemicals judiciously. Right Absolutely. plant, right place. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. Welcome back. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we have a lot to show you today, so we're not taking phone calls today. Sorry about that. We'll just we'll do that next week, hopefully. And we do have a lot of pictures right now, so mm -hmm. we're really just going to kind of roll through these. And, and the reason for the pictures are, they, they say it all, you know. Right. We're talking about what plants can you use. My soil is excellent. I've worked with it over the years. You need good soil that drains well for most of these plants. And you need to, as I said, watch the watering. But what this segment is about is to show you combinations of plants that actually exist. So let's let's roll through some of these pictures. Coming out of the, the back door, actually off the kitchen, there is an area, and we're talking about differences in what stays moist and what might be drier. There is an area where I am convinced there is now an underground water movement there because several of the plants that I loved died over mm -hmm. the year, but with, within the last 10 years, okay? And I had to replace them. I have native um, cinnamon fern in my uh, garden, and then all of a sudden I realized they were taking over this one space. And it is absolutely delightful because that space is moist and other things, some things don't like it, okay? However, on the borders of this, the camellias are thriving, the Burford holly is thriving, but these ferns are so happy. So, example of paths that lead and take you through these areas are very important and I've got lots of those. Maybe it's the grass path, maybe it's the stone path. Okay, we're traveling down that path through the side of the house now. We were behind the house, now we're on the side. And this is the border that borders that sunken patio area. It's uh, probably 15 feet wide and it's loaded with ground cover type stuff with a row of boxwood. I think that's shown better in the next picture. Let's see what is in there. Okay. A little bit closer view, you are seeing a um, small mass of carex, the variegated carex, it's a type of grass. You are seeing some of that sweet box, which is sarcocoa, and you can see they're all low. They're in masses there. They're complementing each other and complementing that row of boxwood that's down through there. There is also brunora, which blooms here, it is closer. 
You can see the, the variegated carex. You see the row of boxwood. Boxwood don't have to be just in a formal garden. I love them and they're scattered throughout the entire garden and it's very natural. There is in a closer view uh, a ground cover that is so underused and so beautiful and so evergreen. This is strawberry begonia. Saxifraga is the proper name. Strawberry begonia. Look at the color in that leaf, Deb. It's beautiful. It blooms right now at this time of the year. It's it's good to use those George Jones to put back you go. blooms when they're <laughs> finished, okay? Because they're not pretty when they're finished. And you want to have some good soil prep on these, right? Absolutely. Need good soil. Okay, let's look at the shrubs that are in that space because that's the next dimension. Those are very low. Now we're looking back on the corner of this planting and we're seeing the dwarfer form of Pieris japonica. We are seeing boxwood in containers. They grow beautifully in containers. And that ground cover of Husta and sweet box that complements it. But it, it's a beautiful space. Husta is one of my absolute oh, favorites. It's lovely. Let's keep going with this. Another type of fern. Uh, ghost fern is so interesting. Played against um, polygonatum, the variegated leaf that you see there. And that can grow up to two and a half to three feet tall. So you've got, you don't have a flat plane here. You've got low, complemented by medium, complemented by a three footer, and you've got diversity there. And in the next picture, you're going to see more of that diversity at the border of that area that I said was moist. It's not wet, it's moist, okay? You see that wonderful fern, but now it's complemented by a, a lot of hydrangea, but also the carex and the hosta in different sizes, plus Nandina. Now, I believe this is looking back in the other direction, a little bit better view of that dwarf Pyrrhus japonica. So let's move on to the next one, okay? It's sort of a repeat. Okay, a little bit closer view of the hydrangea, but, and, and a closer view of that sweet box because it's all in that area. And in the next picture, please. We have, there we go. Now you're seeing a picture of that variegated Brunera. It blooms in the early spring, and then you have these gorgeous leaves that complement the little hosta around it and the fern. And I believe we have one, one more final mm -hmm. picture here. This is the border beyond that one, out in the edge of the woods, that I totally enjoy. There is a line of Barter Valley boxwood Ah, one of my favorites. It's new, Debbie, but I love it. I use it a lot now. And behind that, you've got one nice tall fern coming up in a mass of this wonderfully golden uh, Hakanakloa. Boy, is that a valuable plant. And don't forget to put some accents. I was just going to say, yeah. beautiful yeah. accent back there. <laughs> well, I've kind of got a few of those around. Oh, a around. couple. A couple. <laughs> but you don't see them all at once. Right. You know, as little you surprises as you go through the corners, garden. There, we go. there are accents. Okay. <laughs> well, we've given you a lot of plant names in this segment, so as we go to break, we're going to show a listing of just some of the plants that we highlighted in this segment. So we'll be right back. Welcome back. This hour has flown by and we've got lots of ideas, but the good news is we'll continue next week with, with some of That's these ideas. right, with a little different area. That's right. Mm -hmm. some, and some that's very moist. So we've tried to pack a lot into this, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> she always does. But that's and let's great. Let's continue quickly <laughs> with some of these things because there's the compliment that you get the color from, and that is containers. And we do still have some absolutely beautiful plants to use in them. So please use containers. We don't have the bedding impatience, but there are some beautiful substitutes. And guess what? We're going to come out on the best end with that because with the opportunity to try new different things. And in the next picture, I, I'm showing different levels of plants. I put some on pedestals. I put some on maybe a pot turned upside down, you know? And, and you get a lot of interest in that area. One container that's spectacular can hold its own, but groupings of containers are, are fantastic too. And I try a lot of the new plants in these containers. And in, in the next space, don't forget the value of the perennials combined with um, these plants. I have in ground and in containers. And I do have a water feature here. Don't forget the mosquito bits. Oh, that's so important. Because if you have water that does not move, you need to use those and, and once a week uh, put some mosquito bits in because you want to get rid of those. In the next picture, can't survive without hydrangea. Here are, there's a couple of different varieties. In the next picture, there's actually two. The color variations are dependent, they say, on the soil, okay? I've got some unique situations in mind going on because I've got every color in the rainbow on one plant. Don't forget when you're planning to plan for all seasons. Camellias, there are new hardy camellias and in the fall particularly they are magnificent and the foliage is just spectacular so we want to plan for all seasons. Absolutely. And Debbie, we want to come back to what's in my hand. <laughs> She's been wanting to talk about this all hour. <laughs> This is not a shade plant, okay? <laughs> but it's a timely thing that I want to tell you about because I just, I just cannot imagine being without lavender. Mm -hmm. And lavender is a challenging plant to grow in this area, okay? And I have managed to do it very successfully for a long period of time. Right now, it's in bloom. And there are a number of different varieties, and, and the varieties Hidcoat and Munstead are really in full bloom right now. And prime time to go out and pick them and hang them upside down and let them dry and enjoy them. For, you'd be shocked how long they keep that fragrance mm -hmm. when they're dry. Later will come the larger ones, Provence, and some of the others. Okay, now when this is finished and isn't pretty anymore is the time. I'm, keep that camera there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right, don't reset. <laughs> there With we go. those, I, and chances are, rather than the Joyce Chin, I'm going to go the, the Felco, okay? I, just where those stems meet the foliage, I am going to shear that plant. I am going to dry that um, lavender. Now, when that plant is sheared, it is going to put up new growth and bloom again in the fall. Fantastic. Now, didn't you put a, a Facebook picture of a lavender I did. the other day? Mm -hmm. And I wish that I'd had it in time for the show, but I didn't. Uh, Sharon said, I need, and I took, okay? <laughs> and, and I said, this is my favorite place. Well, it's become the favorite place of a lot of people, mm -hmm. too, because it's a combination of a mass of this lavender with the gray Santalina, and guess what? The orange Asclepius. If you don't have Asclepius, buy some, because it's the monarch butterfly bush. Mm-hmm. And we Wonderful. do hope that you'll you'll join us on Facebook. Follow us, like us. Uh, it's so much fun, and oh, we've been posting some beautiful, beautiful pictures. A lot Facebook. going on there. Mm -hmm. Now, yep. when I said that lavender, and I'm talking sunshine here, not shade. It needs full sun, a minimum of six to seven hours of sun, because that's what this plant gets. Six mm -hmm. to seven hours. I have no place in my garden with full sun. Okay, and it's thriving, but. It has got to have perfect drainage. I mix stones and, and the uh, permatil. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost half and half. Half and uh, half? Oh, almost. Yeah. Okay. For this, because it's the top of the border, it drains well, and it thrives. Debbie, I do want to One share. more plant. Okay. Yeah, I want to share. Do I have time to share? We've got about a minute Please. and a half. 
And please come in and look for some of the new plants. Shade area. This particular plant is a beautiful one, okay? It is incredible. And let me reach over. It's a variegated one. It's the new kid on the block. Here's one that isn't variegated. I don't know if I can turn that. Debbie, can you reach over and turn that fly? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's there really we go. good. That works. Let me lift this flower up. Beautiful, beautiful flowers. That little leaf's in the way there. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, that's okay. You see the other one? Yeah. Beautiful flowers. And now you've got the variegation to go with it. Try some of these. They're just beautiful. Here is another one you can mix with it. Doesn't bloom. But that variegation is spectacular. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Mm -hmm. Be brave. We don't <laughs> brave have people. impatience. Don't worry about That's it. That's right. There's so many more yeah. things to use. Opportunity to try these different things. Absolutely. And speaking of opportunities, yes. next week, give us a little hint of what we're going to be talking about next, next week. Next week, we're going to talk about a slightly different area in mm -hmm. my garden. We're going to talk about pathways that move you through that garden. What do you see when you go down those paths? And a water feature that's just wonderful to all right. love. Oh, you're, you're yes. Just being out in your yard is amazing. Thank you all for joining us. Come back next week to learn more about that. And uh, we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.